the first thing is clear. Clear is that according to Darwin, <laughs> they will have six members. But I want to ask a slightly different question. How many chromosomes they will have? 22 or 24? Do you so think they'll definitely be around in a million years? Somebody? <laughs> uh, Good question. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, my goal today, we are in Institute for Theory of Computing. So my goal today, first, to prove a theory, to really prove it, not hand wave. I want everybody in this room, biologists and computer scientists alike, to understand all the details. Then I want to show how a theory can make or break a biological theory. And then, if time allows, I will show how the theorem will help us, hopefully, to answer the question at the bottom. Okay? I assume that everybody in this room has read The Origin of Species. And it shows, because it's currently... Show <laughs> <laughs> and, and it shows because it's currently number eight best-selling book on evolution on Amazon. I'm right now I'm teaching a course uh, reading it. That's another reason why it is number eight. <laughs> but I want to talk about number seven. Do you know who is number seven? He is number seven. And how many people in this room have read this book? Please raise your hand. One, two, two, three, four. Okay. Uh, this is also Darwin, of course, a century and a half old. This book is also old. Even opponents of this book acknowledge that it's well written. It's an intense edition, 20 years old book. More editions than those. That's amazing. Yeah. Anyway, uh, but only four people in this room <laughs> have read number seven on best selling list. They found it horrible. And Eugene, even New York Times, uh, in the review of this book, argued that Becky is an excellent writer. I'm, I'm talking about yeah, we're writing. We're supposed to believe New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, and it brings another book to talk about, another great book, Dr. Zhivaga. And you know that Dr. Zhivaga was banned in Russia, in Soviet Union. And Pasternak was almost driven to suicide because Every day, there was a paper, a letter from a worker, a peasant, or a fellow writer, intelligentsia, blaming Pasternak for what he's done, by, for writing Dr. Zhivaga. But how could they blame him? Dr. Zhivaga was banned in Russia, so if they have read Dr. Zhivaga, <laughs> they would be in prison. <laughs> and that's why these letters were starting from a phrase. I haven't read Pastor Mark, <laughs> but I condemn it. <laughs> and of course, people in this room condemn me. Right. <laughs> and I now hope that they, you can switch, uh, you can switch the microphone, uh, like video stream, because I'm going to say something politically incorrect, and I don't want Simon's Institute funding to be affected. It's, 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 it's only preserved for eternity, don't worry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have read Becky, and I like it. I think it's an excellent set of challenges to molecular evolution. I'm not religious. I'm not supporter of intelligent design. But neither is Becky, at least explicitly. He made an effort to separate him. He is a professor of biochemistry. It's not a book for dummies. It's actually a sophisticated book to read. You need to know biochemistry a little bit. And nevertheless, it is number seven. I think it is an excellent book to give in the class to, uh, on molecular evolution to challenge students and to explain them how to refute Becky's argument. Becky essentially poses challenges to evolution. He never talks about the identity of creator. He is not. He made an effort to distance himself from, from intelligent designer. However, it's so easy to label that him an intelligent designer because it's easy this way to refute his claims. Can, can I just inject one thing? Yeah. I have actually read all of his things. There's a, there's a second book that he's read. Yes. He's written, plus interviews, plus a lot. I mean, it's one of my vices. I really get deep into this intelligent design stuff. And 
he is not as honest as you are portraying. Of course he is not. That separation he is claiming is a deception. Of course. Of course, it is a very tricky set to discuss uh, what he's done. And, and I'm not, his name is Behe. Behe, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, but then, how many students, biologists, let alone bioinformaticians, in class you teach, would be able to intelligently refute his arguments? How many biology professors who are not specializing in evolution would be able to refute his arguments? And what I saw roughly at the time when I was reading this, I came across fantastic debates that you can find on YouTube between great biologist Russ Doolittle and I forgot the name, some, but debate was moderated by uh, Jerry Fowler, Reverend Jerry Fowler. And it's not easy to debate this thing. And what I think is uh, my daughter, by the way, will be passing, taking her final on evolutionary biology. I talked to her, and from talking to her, I know that evolutionary biology is taught often as a dogma. Sure. And I think this is bad. I think it's very good to give challenging example and challenge students. And Becky so far was the best challenge for me. Okay? But the fact that it's almost taboo in biology classes, I think is wrong. And it brings another great writer, Joseph Brodsky. And Joseph Brodsky was sent to a labor camp in Russia for social parasitism because his poetry was deemed anti-communist and pornographic. And I assure you, neither of his early poetry is pornographic or anti-Soviet explicitly. And I give you citation, uh, like script, from his trial. Witness, I don't know Brodsky, but I know that he writes anti-Soviet poetry. Brodsky, could you recite a single line from my poems? Judge, nobody will sign Brodsky in my country. <laughs> so I almost feel that it's like my daughter was subjected to the same kind of <laughs> principle of teaching evolutionary biology. No challenges presented as a dogma. And I think it's not a good set. And what I want to do today, I want to, like Les told and mentioned in the very first talk, that the standards of proof in biology is completely different than standards of proof in other disciplines. And I wanted people, new people in, brave people in computer science coming in this area and debating evolutionary theory, I wanted to know that Many biological theories are essentially logical fallacies based on poor data. And I will give a few examples. In the last decade, I published four papers in biological journals refuting existing biological theory. Let's go through some of them and then go to the proof of the theory. Theory number one, the master value theory, proposed by a uh, world leading expert on repeats uh, Mark Batzer. So you know that over half of our genomes are repeated DNA. There are millions of copies of ALU in our genome. However, only very few of them are active because if many were active, active in the sense they can propagate and insert themselves in other places in the genome. Because you can imagine that if thousands of them were active, it would be a disaster. We would be constantly bombarded by new insertions of ALU elements. So Mark Barzer came up with his master value theory. There is a single value, master value, that does this bombarding invade human genome, or maybe very few. And when you look at the data, we refuted this and with new algorithm. And we were very nervous of what Mark Barzer would say. It turned out he said something even a month. So we published paper in November 2004. In October 2004, Mark Badzer published a paper refuting his own theory. So we were a little bit late refuting his theory. Example number two, of what regulates protein half-life. So yesterday, there was a talk about importance of building, uh, uh, evaluating uh, propensity of different uh, proteins in the cell. It's very important as an input to further evolutionary analysis. But everything stopped at transcripts. As a result, 
it's already biologically not very relevant because protein half-lives vary by five orders of magnitude. And, but what regulates protein half-life? That was a mystery for some time. And Alex Warshawski barely missed the Nobel Prize for his pioneering studies on protein degradation to the point that 20 luminaries after 2004 Nobel Prize was awarded, 20 luminaries published a paper in Science arguing that Nobel Committee made a mistake by not awarding the Nobel Prize to Warshawski. And one of his contribution uh, was connecting NME and protein half-life. But how many people in this room know what NME is? Very few. Okay, so I have to explain what is NME. So if I ask a question in the class, even in the class of biologists, of what is the first letter in all proteins? The most common answer will be methionine because start codons code for methionine. This is wrong. Most proteins don't start from methionine because there is extremely important mechanism called N-terminal methionine cleavage, which immediately, contrastationally cut out the first methanine. If the second amino acid bacteria to human. So what it does, so it's essentially uh, cut methionine from, if the second amino acid is one of the seven specific amino acids, it works like a clock, it's very precise. So, uh, Warshawski and Ralph Bradshaw from UCSF essentially, essentially was the first to try to explain what enemy does. It regulates protein half-life because if they all start from methionine, there is little variability in the starting position. And in this way, it exposes eight other amino acids as a potential. Uh, 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 and this year, we refuted this connection. And we showed that, the, and also predicted completely different mechanism why it is happening, what enemy is trying to achieve, and why it is important. And in this case, we were not nervous about what Warshawski and Bradshaw will tell, because Bradshaw is the same person here and here was our cause. So essentially, quarter century later, he refuted his own theory. And uh, now, uh, so and if what is interesting is that when you go to original papers, there are really very, uh, very little support from our pers from perspective of computational people. And it even sometimes surprising how gullible <coughs> biologist community can be by accepting this argument, particularly if they published in high profile papers. Anyway, let's go further. And uh, my goal today, actually, where I will be proving my theory, is to disprove one more theory. And it's called uh, random breakage theory. And I will be asking the same questions that Mike asked what is the difference between uh, men and mice? but I will ask it from completely different angle. So if you ask me, Mike was very particular with the data, I'm very naive, if you ask me, this is the difference between human and mouse. Take human genome, uh, all 23 chromosomes, cut it into 280 pieces, shuffle, drop them on the floor, shuffle them, and glue in the new order. You will get roughly the architecture of the mouse genome. Okay. I will show it on a single, how, how it looks like on a single X chromosome. Uh, X chromosome is special genes. It's the only chromosome which retains all its genes from mammalian evolution. So genes do not jump from X chromosome to other chromosome. You can think about this as mini genome, subgenome of the whole gene. And you can think about mouse and human X chromosome as pieces consisting of 11 long so-called blocks or synthesis blocks. And if you have red block here and red block here, they roughly consist of the same gene going in the same order. Of course, there are some small variations, but this is a <coughs> big picture of what's happening. Is it clear? Now, the question is, 
What is the evolutionary scenario for transforming one genome into another? To answer this question, we need to know what are the typical biological operations transforming from one genome to another. This is well known. For example, the most common operation is biology call it inversion, but it's a loaded term in mathematics. That's why we invented 20 years ago, we invented the term reversal. So we will use the term reversal to basically take a chunk of the genome, flip it over. And of course, genome viewed as not a Genome is a permutation of genes for us, and it's signed permutation because genes have directions. That's why this is minus 11, because depending on the strand, it look in one or another direction. And when we flip, directions, signs of flipped element change. Okay? So, you can think this is, inversion is a dramatic transformation of the visual genome. Of course, most of them are little. Uh, so we can think about them as evolutionary earthquake happening with the genome. Well, there. How do you know that most of them are little? Uh, because we don't see many human with significant inversion. I'm talking about serious inversions, inversions of the spans of millions of nuclei. We see differences between two humans that amount to there are many inversions between every two people in this room. But this is small inversions that come maybe a few hundred nucleotides, maybe thousands. But I'm talking about dramatic events. Do you think this, the, the spectrum of ones that occur should be very broad and then they're weeded out very quickly, the big ones are weeded out very quickly by selection? Uh, I, that's a deep question. There is a long answer to this question. But if I start answering, we won't be able to finish. Uh, uh, so, these are earthquake, and then question arises, if, there, if we compare them to earthquake, earthquake are not happening in Moscow, but happening in San Francisco, are there any areas in the genome where earthquake are happening over and over again, or in other words, are there fragile regions in the genome where evolution can break genome and speciate, leading to new species, uh, uh, to, yeah, leading to new species. Rearrangements are very important evolutionary because they create reproductory, often create reproductory barrier between different subpopulations and difference from mutations, single point mutations. So this is a question we're asking. And of course, we are interested that evolutionary scales there are, of course, rearrangement all the time in cancer and a different time scale. But these are uh, rearrangements that lead to death of individuals. So we are not interested in them. We are interested in rearrangements that retain over the course of evolution, uh, presumably neutral or beneficial. Now, and the question is, are there rearrangement hotspots, let's say, in this scenario? This is totally arbitrary scenario. There are millions of possible scenarios between this, even these two. Let's try to see how it works. So we've done this first reversal. There are two earthquakes happening here and here, right? We continue two more earthquakes, two more earthquakes, two more earthquakes. And finally, rearrangement hotspot, there was a rearrangement happening in this small region. These regions are very small. They are not shown to scale, OK? If I wouldn't show them uh, in scales, then that these blocks would be right next to each other. And finally, the first uh, rearrangement hotspot. And in the end, there are three. three golden breaks, three rearrangement hotspots there, OK? But this is arbitrary scenario that has, may have nothing to do with evolution, very small. So we, don't, we have no evidence that there are any rearrangement hotspots. And in are fact, you restricting your attention just to homologous chromosomes, or are you allowing things to cross between arbitrary chromosomes? Uh, so far, I will, I will answer this question a little bit later. So far, I'm only talking about bacterial chromosome, a single chromosome, no other chromosome. In three minutes, I will switch to multiply chromosomes. OK? So 40 years ago, uh, Susumu came up with this uh, random breakage model. The chromosome evolution is random. Uh, and it became very prominent and ex extremely well-cited paper, particularly after Nadeau and Taylor work 30 years ago. And Nadeau and Taylor made this ex asked this question. What happens if we apply n random reversal to a chromosome consisting of n genes? Can we predict how many blocks of these k genes will be generated? And of course we can, right? 
uh, and if we can predict, can we compare it prediction with what we see in real genomes? And if the uh, uh, corresponding distribution match, then we just prove the random breakage model, right? So that's what they've done. And of course, they immediately observe that if you start cutting a string at random position, the length of synteny blocks will follow exponential distribution. And they compared with what, is with what they see in real life. In real life, even when they knew 30 years ago, they knew so little about comparative architecture of human and mouse, but still there was a good fit. 10 years later, there was a fantastic fit. And that's why every biologist thought, that's great. Uh, Nadeau and Taylor and Ona are visionaries, and it became a dogma. In every high-profile papers in the following year, there was a repetition of the statement. And indeed, we observe, we look at the synthetic blocks, and of course, they follow the random breakage theory. So anyway, now let's talk a little bit about mathematics. Let's go to proof of the theory. So what is a reversal? Given a string, a reversal basically does this, and flip it, turn it into a different string. Right? So I just flip identity permutation into a different permutation. Is it clear? OK. Uh, and this reversal introduces two breakpoints, like <coughs> irregularities in gene order. Three shouldn't be stand next to eight, but it stands next to eight as a result of this permutation. And there are many different rearrangement scenarios for transforming a given permutation, let's say, to identity. This is one of them. But is it the fastest one? Well, definitely not, because this is faster. But can we do even faster? Can we turn one genome into another in just, with just three reversals? And we define reversal distance as the minimum number of reversals to transform one sign permutation into another sign permutation. Okay. And we will talk of this reversal distance problem, calculate the reversal distance. And of course, you can label uh, the last permutation the way you want. We will always label it by identity. So it will be sorting by reversal problem, calculate the reversal distance between a permutation and the identity permutation, plus one, plus two, plus n. That's our goal. And now let's switch, answer your question, rearrangement in, uh, in multi-chromosomal genomes. So far, we only talk about single chromosome. Now, uh, this is a uh, book case example, or probably the most famous example of rear rearrangement in biomedical sense. Uh, chromos two chromosome nine, uh, and 22. Uh, undergoes the following transformation. You can think that chromosome 9 breaks somewhere, chromosome 22 breaks somewhere, and then they glued in the wrong way. Okay? Is it clear what's happening? There are very important genes called BCR and ABL that are not supposed to be together, but suddenly they are together and forming a fusion gene. And this fusion gene completely disrupts regulation and leads to essentially a landmark of uh, uh, leukemia, uh, type, special type of leukemia called SEMA. So that's how it's done. Is it clear what is done computationally? Good. And the good news is that this is arguably the most knowledge of this mechanism resulted in arguably, undoubtedly probably, the most successful anti-cancer drug. It's Glivic. It's a miracle pill. If uh, somebody has CML, it's actually treatable and, uh, and completely based on the knowledge of, uh, of what's happening in rearrangement. And that's why there are so much interest these days in figuring out what rearrangements are happening in cancer. OK, but now our computational task becomes much more complex. Before we talk about reversal, and it still was unclear how to design efficient algorithms. Now we talk about translocation, two chromosomes changing in this way, like I show here. And there are also fusions and fissions of chromosomes that you can think about as kind of degenerative ways to translocate, right? So under all these four operations, each of them biologically very reasonable. In, if you open human uh, genetics biomedical books, there will be hundreds of examples for each of them. So under this four operation, I wanted to design an algorithm 
that given one multi-chromosomal genome will transform it into another multi-chromosomal genome with a plausible evolutionary scenario. And now we go back to the uh, computer science history of problems of this type. And the first contribution was actually done by Gates and Papa Dimitriou. And Gates is exactly the Gates you think about. Uh, and Christos probably can tell you a story later, how it happened. But that was an excellent paper. Of course, at that time, uh, it, uh, it, the complexity status was unknown, but clearly the problem was very hard. Uh, and later it only became clear that it is a P. Uh, and then we started, but this is sorting by prefix reversal. So it's only when you allow to make reversal starting at position one. This is not very biological, sorry. Uh, we are interested in every reversal possible. Okay, sorting by reversal problems turns to be pretty pretty hard. Resulted in a uh, difficult algorithm, but thankfully there is a polynomial algorithm for this. It's just uh, rather complex. But what was surprising is that for rearrangements in multi-chromosomal genome, there is also a theory that allows us to come up with this polynomial and fast in practice algorithm for sorting by this rather eclectic sides of operation. And now you're probably waiting for me to prove this result, but I would need three more hours. And that's why I will do something that computer scientists always do when they analyze biological data. I will simplify the problem to the point that it becomes relevant. <laughs> and, but in, the, in my case, I will actually simplify, I need to simplify it I mean, I can solve all this problem. All original results were done in full generality. But since I have very little time left, I have to be quick, and I have to give you a baby version of this theorem. To give you a baby version of this theorem, I have to assume that human chromosomes are cyclic. It will add just a little change to all the results after the compute. And uh, I will introduce the notion of two break distance. OK? Now, how do we represent a linear chromosome? I wanted to turn everything into the uh, language of graph theory now. This is a genome consisting of two circular chromosomes. Let's show this gene by black edges, black directed edges. And let's show all connections by red undirected edges. So this is one genome. This one chromosome, this is another chromosome. That's how we will represent genomes. Okay? Then, what reversal does? When reversal happening, it switches this to, flips this to element. How will it affect our representation? Well, after A, we still have minus B, but after minus B, we have to go to minus D, so we have to go here. After minus D, we have to go to plus C, and finally we should change this. So reversal geometrically conveniently look like this. What have we done? I argue that we remove two edges from our original graph and added two edges on the same set of four vertices, right? So we've done the switch. Okay, so this is reversal. We have uh, intuitive representation for this. And what about fission? When we have fission, we essentially <coughs> change one picture into this one, but it's the same thing. We remove two edges and substitute them by two other edges. It's called two break. And this is the operation I will, try, I will be trying to deal with instead of four different eclectic operations. It's also simplification of biological reality because, in fact, I just introduced under the table slight, something that doesn't happen in biology, but it's a small thing, not to worry about this. But at least you stay with me, you're still with me, right? Okay. Now, how translocation works? Well, this is translocation on linear genome. You can circleize them. Then you can make a two break on this genome and then linearize them. And you can see if you go from here, 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 and here, it's the same thing. So you can model everything as two break. And this, then what do we do? We want to compute two break distances in the genome. It's minimum number of two break, transforming from one genome to two. Now, we're very close to that already. Uh, so we now go to breakpoint graphs. So given two genomes, I show here one chromosome, but there may be multi-chromosomal, of course. 
I want to find the minimum number of reversal to transform one into another. Now, I am surprised that nobody interrupted me and asked, why in the world you are interested in this minimum number of reversals uh, while biology doesn't necessarily follow the Occam Reservoir principle? I expect this question. I won't give you the answer. It doesn't, <coughs> affect, it doesn't affect my results at all in the end. Uh, but since I didn't hear this question, I presume I don't have to. Oh, biology doesn't follow what principle? The Occam Reservoir principle. Okay, the parsimony principle. If you, if you call it parsimony or parsimony. maximum entropy or something, biology doesn't follow it either? No, biology doesn't follow. By molecular biologist, you don't build evolutionary tree based on parsimony principle. You use different techniques to construct real evolutionary tree. But for my argument, <laughs> for my argument, it doesn't affect my biological conclusions, as you will see. But I'm ready. As soon as you ask me a question why I don't look for the most possible <laughs> scenario, I will answer this. Okay, but go ahead. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can you show the translocation picture one more time? I'm missing the two brains. Translocation? Which one's which one came So I wanted to emulate transfer translocation on this linear chromosome. The first thing I do on linear is this chromosome and this chromosome. Um. I supply glue. They turn into circular. Then I do two breaks on this circularized chromosome. They transform into this. Oh, I'm sorry. It's actually this. And then finally, I linearize. And you can see I achieve exactly the same result as shown on the top. Is it clear? OK. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm about to prove two breaks here. Yeah? So, I have to compare P and Q. Allow me, I mean, these are graphs. Allow me to arrange edges of Q the way I want to. And I want to arrange edges of Q exactly as the edges of P are arranged. OK? And then I will just redraw the same genome Q on these new edges. Let's say I look here after A should go to C. It is the same genome, right? And then I will do this. Let me superimpose now P and Q. Yeah. And this is called the breakpoint graph. And this is basically the workhorse of evolu most evolutionary studies. Because it contains as a footprint the history of rearrangements that happen with the gene. Now, what is interesting about this? Now comes a little not very intuitive thing. What we will be interested in, we will focus on red and blue edges. And if we will focus on red and blue edges, what they will form? We remove uh, black edges. Well, there is a black matching and blue ma There is a red matching and blue matching. And of course, together, they form a collection of non-overlapping cycles. The most important thing in evolutionary st uh, in rearrangement studies is this number, the number of cycles in the breakpoint graph. OK? So if we have uh, to construct a graph for multiplier chromosome, we simply do absolutely the same. We arrange edges exactly like here, construct them. It's the same graph, superimpose, cycle PQ equals 3. OK? Now, this is to check whether you listen to me. Given genome P, what genome Q maximizes the cycle number? Exactly. And it will be the genome that is exactly P. Genome itself maximizes the cycle number. Because when you superimpose, the only cycles that are left are the trivial cycles. Right? This is a trivial breakpoint graph. Genome moves itself. And every genome rearrangement, when you move from P to Q, you also change the breakpoint graph all the time. So you, you can think about every evolutionary scenario as a scenario changing breakpoint graph we know what was it was in the beginning. And we know what it will be in the end. Doesn't matter what you've done on, uh, in between, right? So. Uh, why, why, it, we know, why we know uh, how to do it in the end? Because in the end, we transform genome P into genome Q. Okay. So breakpoint graph of P and Q 
should be transformed in the breakpoint graph of Q and Q. And you just pass the quiz when I ask what will be the number of cycles in this graph. Is genome with itself, it always looks the same. Yeah. All right, so this series of two break, we know that cycle number always changes from what we see in the beginning till number of genes. And this is two break distanciarium for undergraduate class. So every certain by two break changes P into Q. It changes breakpoint graph of PQ into breakpoint graph of QQ. It changes the cycle number of PQ into the cycle number of QQ, which we know, which means number of red blue cycle increases in any transformation by this number. Number of blocks minus number of cycles. And the next question, how much each two break can contribute to this increase? Is the answer. What is a two break? We add two edges, right? And therefore we can add at most two new cycles. We also remove two edges which means we must to remove at least one cycle if these two edges belong to one cycle. And therefore, we, every two break creates at most two, destroy at least one, and therefore changes the number of cycles is always less or equal than one. We just prove this area. A two break increases the number of cycles by at most one. There exists a two break increasing the number of cycles by one. I don't show it, but it's very simple. It's just homework and uh, home exercise. And the, we know that every sorting by two break must increase number of cycles by this. And therefore, here's the result. Two break distance between genomes P and Q is this. <laughs> Great. <laughs> OK. Now, the proof of, the, um, of this result in full generality for real, like if you don't circleize chromosome, if you do not allow findings, it may take roughly 40 pages. But I save you from this torture so we can go first. Anyway, after we prove the theorem, we actually compute the two break distance between human Sorry, and the great thing about this is that nobody would write the paper disproving your theorem, right? You know, because but Chris, we uh, haven't come yet to biological theorem. This is just a computa computer idea, mathematical theorem. We are coming to biological theorem now. Okay, so we now can compute the breakpoint, uh, the two break distance between human and mouse. Very simple. Just construct breakpoint graph, compute number of cycle, and I want you to remember the distance between them is 245. And now you should really ask question, why I care about the most parsimonious evolution doesn't necessarily follow. Because the only argument I will use in my biological argument is the lower bound. And lower bound, of course, is also non-trivial, right? So if it is more, it's even better for me. OK? In what sense it is better? Better for what follows. You will see. So, but you have to remember the number 245. And of course, there are numerous 245 step scenarios. I have no clue which of them is correct. And the true scenario may have more than two. And now, really, the proof of biological theory. Are there fragile regions in the human genome? Yes. How would we do this? Here's an argument. Uh, if the random breakage model is correct, then n rearrangements applied to circular chromosomes <laughs> will produce approximately two n blocks. There is a chance that uh, two end points of rearrangement will fall to the same point or roughly to the same point. But think about the human genome. It's huge. The chances are small if you talk about realities of n. Of course, we need to bring scan statistics and Kalmogorov statistics, but I leave it aside. So you are saying that the length of the segments was the wrong parameter to, to analyze? Not yet. Not yet. No, no, it, it, will, it will play a role. It, nothing was wrong yet in the doing teller argument. But I'll come later to... Uh, so since there are... We know that there are 280 human mouse centenary blocks. How we compute this separate story. We only count large blocks of which are million nucleotides uh, long. Uh, since there are 280 human mouse centenary blocks, there must have been approximately 280 over 2, 142 breaks between human and mouse genome, right? 
my next question. However, remember, the two breaks area implies that there were at least 245. And my next question is 245 is approximately equal to 1. Now, this is a loaded question. You need some statistics to demonstrate, let's say, p-value of this. But p-value of this will be so ridiculous that I won't even tell about this. This is just cannot happen. It's really a huge, huge difference. It cannot happen by chance by that. And therefore, since 245 is much larger than 140, we arrive at a contradiction, implying that one of our assumptions is wrong. Which one? Assumption. There was no genome size assumption. The only assumption we made, if the random breakage there, if the random breakage model is correct, was the only assumption in our so proof. It's not for the genome available for arrangements. Right. Yeah, in some, you can interpret. So we just disproved the random breakage model. It has to be done with this caution, but uh, uh, let's assume that we paid attention to statistical issues. And now I really ran out of time. Should I continue to finish? Yes. Oh, OK. Now, and now I want to talk about computational tests versus biological model. Maybe I was just unlucky. Every biological study I was interested in turned out to be wrong. Every biological, little biological theory I was looking at turned out to be wrong. I'm not sending you my papers. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's, let's just think what happened, let's say, with random breakage model. How did, how did it happen that it becomes a dominant theory? Why have biologists embraced the random breakage model? It's psychological, sociological question. It was a clearly logical fallacy. Random breakage model is not the only model that complies with the exponential distribution test. I will explain you in a second that my new model that I will arrive to right in a moment complies equally well with this exponential distribution. Everything was right about exponential distribution. But just there are many things that explain one biological reality. So Darwinism is one excellent explanation of biological reality. But has anybody proven that it's the only one? Are there maybe other explanations that explain everything that Darwinism explained? and does it is a little bit more, excluding intelligent design. Uh, so that's, that's an example. And why was RBM reputed? It doesn't comply with certain biological data and certain algorithmic analysis. It doesn't apply with the absurd breakpoint reuse test. So we need to change the model. But how? And I show you what, from my perspective, is a reasonable way to fix the model and still explain biology. We cannot escape explanation of exponential distribution. So current explanation is genome is a mosaic of fragile regions that take very little portion of the genome and solid regions that practically cannot be broken. There is nothing, nothing surprising in this. If you, you don't want to break ribosomal genes in half, right? So definitely there are regions in the genome. But what this model shows is there are huge regions of the genome that are protected against fragility. Huge. And, uh, uh, okay, so why it explains, it, and this model explains everything that the random breakage explains, but explains more. Because you only should assume that fragile regions are distributed randomly in the genome to arrive to the same exponential distribution of the synteny blocks sizes, right? And uh, that's why uh, we come, came up with this fragile breakage model. So genome model is, genome is a mosaic of uh, fragile and solid region. Uh, solid regions are extremely rarely broken. As a result, very small region of the genome is available for rearrangements. Uh, uh, and is now, is it, does it sound reasonable? Is it correct? Of course it is wrong. Of course we are just constantly approximating the reality. So let me show you what is, what is actually uh, wrong with this model. So if you compare giraffe and 
Also, also pretty much uh, like there are deviations, of course, but, but you know, it would probably the fragile reasons could be different. I'm you're coming right to it's exactly the right question to ask. So uh, there was, of course, certain after we introduced this fragile breakage model, there was certain resistance, but the number of papers now supporting this is overwhelming. So I don't think today people are actually doubt that there are fragile regions and but there are many questions unanswered that remain unanswered. It's non-constructive proof, right, that I gave. I don't know where the fragile regions are. Uh, and another question, we should be critical. So biologists were very gullible by accepting logical fallacy. But just by selling you the just results that I just presented, I'm selling you another logical fallacy, right? And I haven't proven that there are other models that may be even better explain what's going on. So what is this other model? We need to look at data. And that's why I think a very important thing, in addition to what Les said in the beginning, in addition to generation of people <coughs> coming to biologists with these different standards of rigor, there are also, it's amazing time because there are amazing amount of new data coming in. Right? And marrying these two streams, I think is very valuable. And we need to look, when we first disproved the random breakage model, we only had this and this animal. It was actually done in the framework of uh, mouse consortium. Uh, and, but now we have many. And when we have many, we can design one more uh, test called multiply breakpoint reuse test that I don't have time to cover. And uh, if you apply this test to real data, you will see the fragile breakage model largely correct, but needs to be modified. Here's the modification. Yes, recent study, so what this uh, recent study revealed is that in every genome there are fragile regions, but they're not constant. They die and they may appear uh, in the genome. And predictive power to explain data is exactly the same in this series as in another series, but it explains more and complies more with the data. And what comes here next, so this is a uh, turnover fragile breakage flight modification on fragile breakage model. Is it correct? Of course we don't know because who knows how many uh, more precise we can be, but there are very intriguing questions that this biological kind of theory open up. What are where are the fragile regions located? There is, of course, a lot of studies now going on on this. And what causes fragility? Why all of a sudden huge chunks of the genome? There are about dozens of explanations for this in many, many papers uh, proposed. But I think this study opens kind of favors one particular explanation. And uh, uh, this particular explanation relates to another process of the genome, birth and death of repeats that also subject to birth and death. Uh, I don't have time to go into this. So I, do I have three minutes to finish? Oh, I'll stay. Three minutes, yes. Okay. So uh, now, does this, does this model only look back or does it have any predictive power, right? Can we, if we learn about how this fragile brain region are constructed, can we say something about what will happen with this genome in the future? Can we make, let's say, an experiment, assume that we don't know anything about human, move 16 million years back to the common ancestor of macaque and human, and based only on this data and evolution of uh, macaque, make inferences about what will happen in hum with human in the next 16 million years, okay? It turned out that if there is turnover, that fragile regions in human are probably correlated to these fragile regions here. And then we can make predictions about what actually are most likely next breaks in the human genome. And not surprisingly, if we want to learn what are the fragile regions in human, the best way thing to do is to sequence 200 different species of monkey next and carefully look, because they're the most closest. That's why turnover in them is roughly at the same places where they're in human, and look 
at where they were broken in recent 15, 20, 30 million years of evolution. And we verify this prediction by making this kind of sort of argument with Uh Anyway, it's all exciting, but I don't have time. So uh, this was a joint work with Mark Alexeyev and Glenn Tesser. Why it is um, hard to really validate the, the assumptions on the breakage with all the data that we have today and techniques for ancestral reconstruction of genomes? <coughs> Still, you cannot really see if your algorithm and prediction, it's not prediction, if your algorithm. We have very few genomes that are within 20 million years from human sequence. We have very few such genomes so far. And everything that goes beyond this, let's say, mouse, of course we can find regions that are in mouse or shared between mouse and rats that are broken. But since there is a turnover of these regions, since they move all the time, and now there is a mechanism why they move, then predictions on distant species don't tell us what's happening now with the human. So past, don't tell us where the regions are currently located in human. I meant reconstruction, not prediction, but to the past. To, to, really, to, to really measure your, your, whether you're parsimonious or whether your algorithm, it's not prediction, but reconstruction. More validation with respect to, to all the data, the richness. That oh, are you talking about reconstruction of ancestral genomes? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, this is a very active area. Uh, David Hausler worked actively in this area, and I think this algorithm worked very we, we well. Work in this area, we uh, have two algorithms and one web server for this, and I think this algorithm worked quite well. Like if you look from the common sense perspective, most likely they reconstruct really well uh, ancient uh, organization of ancestry. So you could, so so when Christos asked about the giraffe, you could see if you you. Could, um, see if you really reconstruct well the, the, the size of the, or not the size, the history of the... Um. There is no doubt, as soon as we have hundreds of mammalian genome sequence, we will have very accurate information about genomic architecture of ancestor. So we know, we will know what happens, what, what arrangement happened in the past when giraffe start growing its neck. As soon as we sequence all kind of related animals that David Hausler showed that this is a very accurate prediction. Your algorithm, that your algorithm is accurate. Uh, there is our algorithm, there is David Hausler algorithm, there are two of our algorithms, there is David Hausler algorithm, and they all roughly produce the same result. Yeah. Uh, I recall looking uh, when the yeast genomes came out that you tend to get the breakpoints at duplicated genes. We obviously have homology for recombination. Is that seen generally? Uh, have you run your algorithm on the yeast genomes? Uh, I do not know. It's I do not know. Check, yeah. What's the somewhat related question? You know, I guess a lot of these vents should be meiotic, and they wouldn't necessarily be fragile sites. In germ cells, and, and in fact, there are meiotic hotspots that might like, be a better way to model some of this, right? From Molly, Syria's work. So I, I this don't this doesn't doesn't provide any insight into biology yeah, of what's understand. happening. It's more like mechanics of what's happening, with exception of it provides insight <coughs> of what triggers this reaction. Uh, and I can tell you that they are triggered by tandem segmental duplications, two segmental duplication longs flanking the repeat. What's, what's the mechanism for, the, for, for defining a fragile, what, what defines a fragile region? Uh, great question. Uh, so there are, as I said, there were maybe 10 different hypotheses of what triggers fragility, and I favor one of them, recent one, uh, and this is fragilities 
uh, triggered by a couple of very long semantic duplications, let's say thousand, maybe 10,000 long, uh, that have ability to, uh, in 3D somehow, to promote this, to trigger this effect. But there are 10 others. There will be 10 others at least were published. Yeah. Why don't genes jump in and out of the X chromosome? That's a good question. So uh, there is this effect called X chromosome inactivation because you don't want to have, like, you don't want human and man to be too different. And there are many genes that have nothing to do with sex on X chromosome. So if there was no X chromosome, the, uh, X chromosome, what is the right name? Deactivation. Deactivation, right. Then uh, some of us would have twice larger expression than us. So, Pavel. Two, two, two things. Oh, one is a very straightforward question. Um, could you elaborate just a little bit on one minute? What, what, what defines the fire generation? What kind of repeats? What is duplicated? And what, what is the characteristic size of that duplication? OK. So that's, by the way, subject of active studies right now. But in the published papers, so the hypothesis is if there are two segmental duplications, uh, the, uh, they are not tandem, I'm sorry, matching segmental duplication. One is like this, and another is, watch my hands, like this. Yeah, yeah. Then it promotes ability, ab to ability to make a tra uh, a rearrangements whose endpoints are located in these regions. Oh, Re for reasonable mechanism, it's a really very good mechanistic explanation that I think many biologists would accept. But until recently, until 2009, paper on this in genome research, there was no evidence for this. Oh, okay, then. And then, and then a bit of uh, epistemological nature. Mm, uh, you refer to the demise of the RBM model uh, as the expansion of a logical fallacy. That what I think, however, is a fallacy in this statement. Oh, mm, there was no logical fallacy. was a very good now hypothesis of what is going on, a very natural resolution. And with the test, namely the fit to the exponential distribution that was available to Nadeau and Taylor, uh, this now hypothesis stood the test. It was not falsified by that test. So it was completely natural to accept that, um, uh, that hypothesis. What was, what was wrong there is the ridiculousness of accepting that hypothesis as some sort of the of final truth. Yes. But that's not a logical fallacy. There was no log no violation of logic. It's sort of typical epistemological fallacy. Right, know? but that's 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 actually substitutes the difference in uh, standards of logical arguments between two communities. Computer scientists would never be able to publish a paper where computer science would present a hypothesis and not even make a footnote that is probably one of 100 different explanations. As a result, the paper is published in high-profile journals. 10 years later, thinks that it's a dogma. 10 years later, most of the community think it's a dogma. And that, that's what's happening. Yes and, not, yes and not quite. The RBA model is, oh, mm, oh, is, is one of thousands of explanations. But they are not all equal. Some are more equal than others. Mm -hmm. And I will argue that the RBM model is more equal because it's the simplest. It does not have to be the truth. Once you come up with, the, uh, with another test that did nicely and refuted, then you replace it with another fallacy. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Agree? Yeah. 